Welcome. Thanks for listening to Cherry Beckard's Government and Public Sector Podcast Series. In each episode, we hear from the best in the business on the latest challenges, trends, and opportunities affecting the government and public sector. I'm Christian Fjolgrad, leader of Cherry Beckard's Government and Public Sector Industry Team. I hope you enjoy and thank you for joining. Hello, and welcome back to our podcast mini series about grants management. I am Kimberly Konzak, and here joining me today is Shua Jung and Kat Kizier. Uh, we also have a special guest today, Anthony Walsh. Um, I am Kimberly Konzak, and I have been working in the grants management space for the last four years. And here at Cherry Becker, we have a fantastic grants management team um, who can help you help educate you on grants management in general. And then we offer uh, the grants management life cycle of services. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Shua to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Shua. I'm the grant man uh, Grants Management Service Leader here at Tara Becker. And I am Kat Kizier. I am a Senior Associate in the Advisory Section with Cherry Becker. And as I mentioned, we have a guest today, Anthony Walsh, who is an auditor and expert in the single audit here at Cherry Becker. Anthony. Thanks, Kimberly. Yes, I'm Anthony Walsh. I'm a senior manager. I work exclusively in our government and public services sector, um, and I've been doing governmental assurance services now for about 10 years, um, exclusively governmental services, uh, municipalities, etc., um, focusing on, of course, uh, their financial statement audits, but they're also their single audits. That's great, and I know working in the grant space so far, single audit is a, a very big component of what we look at um, when it comes to grants as well. So really excited to have you with us today, Anthony. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask you a question here, Kat. In the world okay. of grants, what is direct cost? So <clears throat> there are two types of costs that are related to a grant. The first one is a direct cost, and this is any cost that can be specifically identified with a particular project or program or an activity, and it can be directly assigned to these activities relatively easily. It's not difficult. We know those costs go directly to that activity, um, and with a high degree of accuracy as well. So direct costs may include things like salaries, travel expenses, equipment, and supplies, but there's also other costs that may also be considered a direct cost when you are looking at grant costs. Um, so when you are determining if a cost can be considered a direct cost to a grant, you have to ask yourself if that cost directly benefits the grant supporter project or activity. So direct co cost must, not should, it can't, well, maybe it does, I don't know. It has to actually direct, be directly associated with that grant or activity or you do not charge that cost to the grant. Um, also, you need to look in your, when you're talking about direct costs, you need to look at your terms and conditions of your grants and look at special conditions and make sure that your direct costs are actually being um, compliant with what your grant says it should be. So on the opposite of that, to understand what the actual direct cost is, you also need to understand what an indirect cost is. So it's basically like the counterpart of the direct cost. Um, indirect costs are a little more complicated. You can't really identify them easy. Um, they are related with a project, but not specifically that project. It may be that these costs are together for a joint project. Um, and they are considered necessary to the operation of your organization and the performance of that particular project. Um, an example of an indirect cost related to a grant may be like maintenance of a facility or depreciation and administrative salary is a big one as well. So. Real quick example, let's take a utility bill, electric bill. You have a building that you are actually supporting with a grant and all your projects and activities for those grants is happening in that building. That electric bill you're getting and the cost of that bill, you know easily and accurately 
it directly relates to your project. It's a direct cost for your grant. But let's say under that roof of that building, you have multiple projects going on, not just the ones for your grant, but multiple projects. So you know a percentage or a part of that cost for that electricity is going to be charged to the grant, but you can't easily figure that out. You don't know for sure. Is it a percentage? You might, you know, depend it's a percentage, and that's where indirect cost rates come into play. But we're not going to get into that this time because we're talking about direct this time. So that's the difference between a direct cost and an indirect cost. Thank you, Kat. Mm -hmm. So to make sure we get it right, though, what steps can we take, can a grant recipient take to ensure they have properly determined their direct costs and have assurance that their direct costs are allowable and avoid audit findings? That's really a good question, Kimberly. So from our perspective, there are four questions you would like to ask yourself. It depends on how do you want to answer those questions. You may have a direct cost, you may have an indirect cost, or you might have some cost that's not necessarily, you know, allowable in any circumstances. So the first one you want to ask yourself is, does the cost result in a direct benefit to the program? The answer should be yes, of course. The answer shouldn't be, huh, I'm not so sure, or I guess that's not gonna be good if you try to justify something to the auditor or to your donor. The second question you want to ask yourself is, can it be easily traced and accurately traced to the program? You may have a couple of mixed expenditures here and there, uh, a sort of generally benefit your program, one program or a couple of programs. If you cannot easily and accurately trace an expenditure, expenditure to a program, you may consider not to use that expenditure as your direct cost because you will not be able to define yourself if it is selected by the auditor. The third question is, does it benefit only one program? Or does the portion you want to charge to that program benefit that one program? The fourth one is, is it normally charged as indirect cost? This could be a tricky one because you as an organization incur all kinds of costs. And technically, a good number of those costs benefit all of your project. And some of them, according to your organizational indirect cost structure, may be included as your indirect cost historically and goes into your NICRA calculation or organizational indirect cost calculation. Although you can argue one way or the other, it kind of directly impact a certain amount of your grant or one grant, you usually put it as indirect cost. If that's the case, you probably should charge it as indirect rather than direct cost. So there are a couple of um, straightforward assumptions that you can make in terms of your allowable cost. Um, one, is that there are some costs just generally not considered allowable in any circumstances. For example, per uniform guidance, alcohol is definitely something they will not allow on the grant. The same thing goes to first class plane tickets, unless it's absolutely necessary and pre-approved uh, pre by the donor. You're also generally not allowed to put in raffle tickets or amusement park tickets or any entertainment of the sort. They are not allowable on any of the grants. The second type of expenditures are may or may not be allowable. For example, if you try to buy some furniture that could benefit your grant, however your budget that does not allow it then you should consider those expenditures either contribution or not allowable at all these expenditures are 
in principle allowed by uniform guidance. However, in your specific grant condition, they are not allowable. The third one is your cost allowable only if treated consistently as part of the cost. The biggest problem with some of the organizations we have seen is for the same type of expenditure, sometimes they put it into direct cost pool, sometimes they put it into indirect cost pool, but when you look at the nature of that expenditure, every single time they are exactly the same. That will, cre that will create an issue for your organization because it seems like there is uncertainty of how something is treated. So we definitely recommend you as an organization, look at the type of expenditures you usually incur and make a determination if something belongs to your direct cost pool or indirect cost pool. Okay, thank you, Shua. That's a lot of information about what's allowable, what's unallowable. So is there a place we could go to find what's allowable and unallowable? Oh, I have that. I, uh, I, I have the answer for you. <laughs> so the, the one place you always want to go is to Uniform Guidance, right? So Uniform Guidance 2 CFR 200.413. That's your go-to to provide guidance for your direct costs. On top of that, always check your state and local statutes and see if they have anything as far as costing goes, direct or indirect cost, and if they have any stipulations. Um, your grantor and your donor, as we stated before, will also have terms and conditions, and they'll also have information on their websites for the most part. So those are some more resources you can use, is look at websites, look at, um, uh, other parts of the 2 CFR 200 also that may be specifically related to your donor or grantor as well and use that information to determine your direct costs and the allowability of your direct costs. That's great and um, I have had the the pleasure of reading some of the uniform guidance and it is a great resource. So Anthony, speaking of allowability, how does a grant recipient determine if their direct costs are allowable? And what do you as an auditor look for when it comes to allowability of direct costs with grants? And if you could give us some examples of typical audit findings that you have come across related to expenditure justification, that would be great. Sure. So I think the, the first place to start would be the grant agreement um, with the grantor. That oftentimes spells out where you need to look for what items are going to be allowable or unallowable. Um, here in Florida, a lot of times our grant agreements will point you to either the state or a federal guidance for that particular funding. Um, it'll spell out what costs are allowable um, or it'll have an addendum that specifically allows or disallows certain costs in addition to um, what's in the compliance supplement or the uniform guidance. Um, from there, I would say, I just mentioned the compliance supplement, that would be the next place I would look. Um, that's where your auditor is going to start. Um, we're going to receive your schedule of expenditures of federal awards um, at the end of the year. And then from there, we do some calculations to determine which programs we need to audit. Um, we take that and then we look at the compliance supplement and say, okay, here are the areas that we have to test. Here are what are called compliance requirements that we have to look at. Um, direct costs and allowable costs are one of those areas that we're required to focus on depending on the grant. Um, that will tell us what is allowed or, or disallowed for each program. Um, so for instance, uh, highway planning and construction 2205. Um, a lot of times people look at that and they think it's really just specifically highway planning and construction, just the design and maintenance of roads. Um, it's actually a little broader than that. I've had a governmental entity who used it for a um, bicycle safety campaign. Um, they were allowed to use that funding um, in conversation with the federal government that was deemed allowed. And so they were allowed to use that funding as part of a bicycle safety program. Um, buying advertisements and all that sort of thing to increase bicycle safety awareness. So like I said, you really do want to get into the, the, you know, the grant agreement and the compliance supplement to see what's allowed and disallowed. Um, that's where we're going to start as auditors. As far as um, some items that are um, 
for instances where we've had issues, um, you know, it we saw it a lot where there were gray areas during COVID of things that were allowed um, that then weren't afterwards. Um, certain supplies and things that you were entitled to buy with certain grants that then went away or grants that were um, during COVID allowed to be used to pay for salaries beyond the specific direct function. It could be applied broadly to an entity, um, say airports, who were able to offset some of their costs um, related to salaries during COVID um, due to the you know the the transportation industry decline and during that time period um obviously that switched after that period and so that initial that covid fu based funding was allowed to be used for that but there were the the standard funding from the federal government went back to direct um and so there have been instances where we you know we've seen it in entities like that that have had um some of those issues um and then just the traditional you know something got billed to the wrong project and the expense got rolled up and it somehow made it through um, has happened before where you've seen um, expenditures that weren't related to a grant program somehow fall through the cracks and get um, expensed and reported and reimbursed and you know that ultimately becomes a finding and a question cost and all that good stuff that nobody wants to run into as a part of their audit but just um, adds to the fact that you know you need to have a quality control process over this um, just like you would financial statements, just like you would any other part of running your operation. Uh, you want to make sure that what ultimately gets submitted to the federal or state government for reimbursement truly is an allowable cost um, and, and not something where you're going to have, you know, when we come in, then have a finding and a question cost related to it. So. Yeah, so if you do come in and have a finding and a question cost, um, what happens then? As you will have that reported um, in addition to your schedule of expenditures. Um, so that'll be uh, on your schedule of findings and question costs, which gets reported to the federal government, gets um, included with your uh, data collection form upload. Um, beyond that, it's up to the federal government as to how they handle that. Every department is different. Every uh, I wouldn't say agent, but every uh, person who works for those departments is different in how they process and, and determine um, how they're going to deal with those. So there could be penalties related to that. There could be clawbacks related to that. Um, but ultimately, um, it's within their purview. It's not like there's a standard. This is what's going to happen, um, at least in my experience. Sure. Well, that's helpful. Thank you, Anthony. And it's it's just kind of reiterating the theme that you're finding now two episodes in that um, it's so important to be in compliance, to report accurately um, so that you have a successful grant program. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you, Kat, Shua, and Anthony for joining. Um, if you would like to reach out with any to any of us, uh, I can be reached at Kimberly.Konzak at CBH.com. Shua can be reached at Shua Chung at CBH.com. And Kat can be reached at Kat.Kizier at CBH.com. And finally, Anthony can be reached at Anthony.Walsh at CBH.com. This is Christian again. I hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to our next one. Don't forget to subscribe.